So uh, a little my presentation on uh, small angle neutron scattering. So first small angle what? Um, I looked a bit and I found a very uh, simple source that I could uh, from the ILL, a little video that was made from uh, last year, trying to explain in very, very simple words what small angle can how do. And let me share this and change audio. Do you want to optimize your products? Do you need to analyze how your preparations Perfect. behave? Why not use SANS, small angle neutron scattering? SANS lets you explore the microstructure of liquids and solids at scales ranging from one nanometer to one tenth of a micron. Why is it useful to know their microstructure? Imagine you want to manufacture a shampoo with a brand new active molecule. The problem with active molecules is that they are often hydrophobic. They dilute very little in water. And shampoo is an aqueous preparation that is used beneath water. Therefore, the active molecules are encapsulated in aggregates of surfactants. But the mixture is very liquid and not very practical to use. So, a thickener is also added to the mixture. But manufacturers don't want an excessively viscous, glue-like mixture that is difficult to get out of the bottle. So, how do you best proportion each ingredient to obtain an attractive shampoo, which is stable in a wide temperature range and over time, and which is easy to rinse off? This is when things start to get really tricky. SANS measurements help you optimize your formulations. They let you observe how the molecules in your shampoo are organized. How does this work? A product sample is placed in a SANS instrument. The instrument is temperature controlled and an injection system allows blending if necessary. A beam of neutrons is directed at the sample. The matter of the shampoo deflects some neutrons from their trajectory. A large detector records the position of these deflected neutrons. The result is curious figures, which the experts will analyze. This measurement makes it possible to determine the shapes, sizes, and spatial organization of the scatters of structures in your shampoo, ranging from one nanometer to one tenth of a micron. It's even possible to detail the size and nature of the lipid layers or bilayers, the barriers that encapsulate the active molecules. SANS is a major technique that is also applied to many other systems, polymers, colloids, biological macromolecules, emulsions, pores in solids, aggregates in alloys, and even magnetic microstructures. Available in neutron centers, SANS gives you a novel perspective on the organization of microstructures. So here a little uh, start a, a very simple explanation, I would say, for general public. Yeah. Gives already a first idea of what uh, SANS is and what's about. Uh, but then, uh, why do we call it small angle neutron scattering? So, coming from Bragg's law, uh, where uh, n lambda equals 2d sin theta, in a standard diffraction uh, experiment where still our incoming wavelength is in the 1 to 10 angstrom usually. The angle is usually around the 10. It's still some big ang angles. That gives uh, things we can see usually in the order of 1 to 10 angstrom. But here in small angle, we still have the same incoming uh, wavelength. But then the angle is much smaller, usually in the range of 0.3 to 5. Uh, degrees, which gives uh, the things we are looking at more in the range to of 1 to 500 nanometers. Small angle is just because it's the angle at which we look, uh, there's diffraction. So the types of things we can see in small angle, that doesn't change whether we are in small angle x-ray or neutron. It's still about the same size that we look at. It's anything from nanoparticles and mini micelles to much larger things like polymers and proteins. The most important thing uh, that we can start off is the intensity that we can get from small angle. 
the intensity is proportional to the number of particles times the volume squared, which is something kind of fixed. And then the important part is the scattering length, the difference in scattering densities, the form factor, the structure factor, plus some background. In general, the background is mostly incoherent scattering. Sorry, my microphone turned off. You can hear me now? Yes. Oh, yeah, I don't know why my microphone turned off. Uh, then I'll restart. Excuse me. Um, we, we saw the first slide. It was yeah, the, so the first slide I was talking just to explain that uh, small angle is because the angle we are looking at, it's smaller than a standard diffraction experiment, where instead of uh, the 30, which a sin 30 is between we, those big angles, our sin is mostly around 1 and 0.1. So our size that we look at is 1 to 10 angstrom. In small angles, we are at much smaller angles, which gives much bigger sizes. Uh, the size of, and this is was the size of things we, we were able to look at, is um, from small uh, nanoparticles to the bigger polymers, some proteins. Um, and then I'm come back to here. So the uh, important part uh, here is the intensity of what we of the signal, which is uh, proportional to the number of particle uh, and the volume they take. But most importantly, it is from the scattering length, the intensity, the scattering length density uh, difference between the solvents and the particles we look at. The form factor is the structure factor and the background. The background is mostly incoherent. Uh, and then what is the scattering, what is a scattering length density? The scattering length density is the number of Avogadro times the density of the compound divided by its molecular weight. And this times the sum of all scattering length of each element of, uh, of our sample. This is the difference between the scattering length density of what we're looking, the particle we're looking at and the solvent is the contrast. And if we don't have any contrast, then our intensity will be close to zero. So another important thing about Venus principle is what's most important, it's the difference. We don't care who is the highest or lowest between the solvent and our particle because it is uh, proportional to the square of the difference, which means that whether it is the little coil here that we see, whether it's that is in red and the other is in blue or the inverse, we still see the same information of a coil in something. Uh, what this can um, bring us is in case we're looking at some more complex systems where in like in a core shell system where we might not have the same thing on the core than in the shell, uh, like we see here, a core red, a shell blue, and in normal water, then we'd have something else. If we would just look uh, on the information from here, then we'd have overlapping information. We'd have a very complex signal to see, but then we can separate in multiple uh, parts and once uh, match the contrast with uh, the shell, and then the only thing that we'll see uh, that gets out of it, it's the core and another one where we do the other part. And then we have information on the core and the shell, which are two different. To help on that, mostly for biology things, there's always been some uh, tables on how much uh, deuterium fraction, depending on which part of uh, the things we want to look at, we can match as a, the contrast. Now, um, some data analysis, there is some simple, a bit less accurate things like part slopes or Guinea approximation, or a bit more complex, but then of course more accurate is fitting the results to some models or structures that we get from the crystals or even simulations for more complex things. And I will start uh, with some simple, I'll start with Pard law. Pard law says that for sharp interfaces, smooth surface and at high angle, then the intensity 
is proportional to one over Q to the power four. This can change a bit depending on the particle dimension and size. Uh, here, if we consider simple particles, uh, 3D particles uh, without much shape, then uh, we see that uh, the B signal has a shoulder that is at lower Q because it's higher. Uh, I was talking about just a part law that there mostly the, there is some change with the size. The bigger particle will have its uh, kink at lower Q since we're in reciprocal space. Then Q to the minus four, um, this is for sharp smooth interface of 3D objects. We, this can change depending on dimension because if we look on a string or one dimensional object, then the slope will be a Q1, uh, Q to the minus one on 2D, Q to the minus three or general 3D object, Q to the minus four. But it can also give us, if you, we look from a bit further away, some information about the fractal dimension of our uh, system, like uh, a polymer. Is it uh, a Gaussian chain in a dilute environment? Is it a swollen coin? Is it completely collapsed? Uh, this for the mass fractal, so the fractal of the mass, uh, or about the surface fractal. Uh, as an example here, uh, we can see uh, the porod plot, which is a log i over log q, a part plot of DNA in ethylene glycol done at 50 degrees. This is above the helix to coil transition. So normally we should be in a coil. And what we see here is a slope of minus 1.76, which is very close to uh, a slope uh, that we can see here of Q to the minus five third, which means that we are, uh, we have a good signature for a swollen coil and not a helix. But then things can be a bit more complicated. Uh, we can have different porod regions because if we look on the first one, some rod networks, if we look at very wide, then we have a network uh, very of some sort with a Q to the minus two, but then when we look a bit smaller, then we can have also 1D objects. It's a network of 1D objects. So we'll have a part at Q to the minus two, some part at Q to the minus one. This is what you can get for some part slopes. Then there's the Guinea approximation. So here at low concentration and small Q, uh, we can simplify the equation to have the intensity be a relation to the gyration radius and uh, to the square times Q square. This approximation most works only when the gyrus, uh, the radius of gyration times Q is roughly maximum one. Above that, we need to change a little bit the equation. Um, but first, I want to explain a bit what's the gyration, the radius of gyration. Maybe not everyone understands. So the radius of gyration is the average of the square distance from the center, which is an information about the uh, inertia uh, of the molecule on uh, the on gyration. It depends on the shape, like simple shapes, like a sphere has a simple, the RG squared equals uh, 3 fifths R squared, but then a cylinder has some other information, R squared, so the radius squared times two plus the height of it. So the information we get is RG, if we have cylinders, we don't know if you have a long thin cylinder or a small flat cylinder, which is more like a disc. Um, so on a Guinea plot, which is the log of I over Q squared, we look at then very small Q and we have here a uh, PD5 pleuronics, which is a uh, co-block tripolymer, uh, this in D2O. We look at the slope, uh, which is minus RG squared divided by two. And we see we this gives us an RG of 34 angstroms. 
then we need to get more information to know exactly the size of what. But here we have the general, the radius of gyration of our molecules. So if we put together the two general approximations that we have, then if we have, let's say, a cylinder on a very simple way, we have the first uh, Guinea region. This is the part we were talking about. Then there needs to be a little bit uh, different uh, equation uh, for an intermediate region, which can still give some information about, about size. And then we have our porid region at a bit higher Q. Then the next part that was important is the form factor, f of q. It's the shape that we'll get at higher q. It depends only on the shape of the. It depends on the shape of the molecule. If the we are in a solute uh, solution, then s of q equals one. Then the intensity is proportional to the form, the f of q. We assume generally an isotropy for the simplest models. And then we have our form factor, which is a function of Q and um, a shape parameter, mostly the gyration radius, which will give the different uh, bumps that we can see. So here is an example of uh, simulated data where we can see a disk has kind of a flat uh, signal. A cylinder has partly uh, deep uh, points, and a disk has even bigger points. This can be then coupled with the, what we saw just before. And then we see that in the port in that the form factor is mostly in the part region. So we the more we look at our data, then the more we can get information out of it. And that's why simplifying is helpful. Another thing that can change the shape of the signal we get is polydispersity. So Often when we look at the size, let's say, of some physicals, they're not all, there's very rarely all exactly the same size. There might be some difference in, in mass of a polymer or vesicle size. And this, as uh, we went saw before, the form factor uh, is dependent also on the gyration radius. So the signal of each size, each size of particle, green, red, or blue, will give us a different signal with, with our little troughs at different places. This uh, blur broadens the feature, which means it is harder to understand what we see, the more uh, different the sample we're looking at. As a little example, uh, here we have uh, gold nanorods. Uh, we, there, so there's a, uh, a picture on the, uh, of what they look like. And then we have the signal in blue. To get these, then uh, we need to get some models. There's a lot of uh, application that gives uh, help for fitting functions. It is useful to know what we're looking at. We already know that we are trying to look for nano roots. So putting in some parameters, then we can get the radius, the length of our rods, and even the polydispersity of our sample. Then uh, for the structure factor, um, this is, so if we dilute the structure factor equals one, which we talked, but sometimes there is still some uh, interaction, and so the structure factor is not equal one. So what that happen that means is suddenly um, the max there is a maximum, a peak of a maximum before slowly settling to one. So if this is in, then our signal uh, here is an example of um, polystyrene sphere and glycerol. Um, if we take a very dilute system, which are the lower uh, open cubes, then we have a signal that is uh, resembling the ones we saw before. But then increasing concentration, first we see an increase in signal with still all the features there and nothing too different. But then once we get to higher concentration, then we start, the first thing we see is an increase with the first peak before seeing the rest. So getting all those uh, it's the points here are a telltale that we have a, a structure factor that is not equal to one that then um, something that is useful to have because we have often mixing of the form factor and the structure factor is to do concentration series 
taking the same thing, a different concentration like we saw before, if the general shape does not change, like we see here, then we can say that in all our samples, the structure factor is equal to one. But if we look like we looked here with our peak, then if we assume that on the lowest one, the structure factor is one, then taking this uh, in our model, we can, we can extract the structure factor for all the other models and see the structure factor of our, of our um, uh, mixture. Uh, a little uh, explanation about instruments. So how does the general instrument work? So we have the neutron beam coming in first, then we monochromate. We want the most uh, monochromatic being possible. Then through some aperture, uh, we select how wide, small, the intensity we get in. And mostly we try to get our, our beam the most parallel possible. Then we have our sample. Uh, and then there is the diffraction and the detector at a certain distance. It's a line uh, setup. But often uh, the instruments are big. Uh, why? It's uh, because uh, the Q uh, value is uh, a function of uh, theta. And um, resolving, we can get that Q is then is when a, the straight line Q is, a de uh, is dependent on the distance between the sample and the detector. So if we have a detector 10 times further, we can go to a Q 10 times lower. And this is very useful, like an instrument, then uh, like on D11, this is the scheme on D11, where the monochromator is a velocity selector. Um, then diaphragms to collimate, uh, to, um, to choose the shape and uh, collimators to help increase. And then we see uh, the big uh, tube of D11, the big yellow tube if people go into uh, ILL7. Uh, here I'll also show a little um, video from D11 so people have maybe a better idea. So looking from the start with uh, the velocity selector, here we follow into the neutron tube where it goes, uh, the neutrons here are monochromated, then they go through uh, different uh, collimator to have either wide or thin sample. Then to hit the sample, mm -hmm. then to hit the sample and then finish on the detector a long way further. So the collimator, as I, oops, as I said before, the collimator, why do we have a collimator? Because if we didn't have a collimated uh, signal, then we'd have a spread of angles of the neutrons coming in. And since we're looking at very small um, angles, if the incoming angle of uh, the neutrons coming in have, let's say an incoming angle variation of one degree, then we wouldn't be able to measure anything under one degree. So it's very important to get um, a good collimation. And then diaphragms, uh, we have different diaphragms giving us either a big or a small. With bigger diaphragms, we have bigger flux, but then we average over a larger surface, which is a trade-off how fast, how precise we want. Uh, samples can be either uh, fixed, but uh, then we have maybe some problems because if our problem is not isotropic, then if we have, let's say rods, if we look at the rods from the side or from the top, in one way, it will be a line and the other, it'll be a circle. So we could see different things. Sometimes we want to see those. Sometimes we can also just rotate the sample. So we have an average off. 
we can force the sample into specific orientation, either via mechanical or magnetic uh, ways. And then how to get the different, a lot of Q vec values is having the detector, having a big tube, either having the detector very close, which will give us information at high ang at higher angles. And then when we are longer distance, it's only the small angles that will spread out to and have more definition for smaller angles. A little example of images is here the image uh, of a sample at 20 meter with the detector at 20 meter after the sample. We have a nice ring plus a blurred out yeah, uh, secondary ring, which we can't see. But then at 39 meters, then that white part, that yellow part that was kind of blurred out, now we can see has another ring. Unfortunately, one big uh, thing limiting those angles is the distance here. Uh, so D11, which is or has already a tube of 40 meter. And uh, size is uh, unfortunately limiting us. And so here are some of the references. So some of the ILL videos that I got from the website and uh, the sense toolbox from uh, what I'm Mahmouda on the uh, NIST, uh, working from NIST, a very uh, useful uh, and quite complete uh, explanation on sense and neutron scattering. Thank you.